All right. Hello, everybody. This is Martha Alter Hines again. And today I have yet another beautiful, wonderful treat. We're going to be having a conversation with Jonathan Coe, who many of you are already very familiar with and uh, love. And the reason that I asked Jonathan to do this interview, um, I mean, I knew that I wanted to do this when I asked you, Jonathan, but then since then, in the last few days, the world has had things transpiring <laughs> that mm -hmm. make this conversation even more, mm, I would say, compelling and um, even more alive in myself and I think in you of why the conversation we're about to have, I think, is is perfectly timed in this moment um yeah. so so what we're here to talk about is mars and um the reason just to give context to, for all of you why we're having this conversation is because what was it two weeks ago mm -hmm. uh jonathan you co-led the eclipse panel the eclipse panel <laughs> right and at the very end um you mentioned maybe even after we stopped recording you mentioned that you were about to be leading your own Mars series. It's actually, I, um, yeah, it's an eight-week oh, container. Mm -hmm. Eight-week container. Okay, beautiful. And <clears throat> and I immediately perked up and the other people perked up. Wait a minute. Jonathan doing something on Mars? <laughs> that, just right there, that is, you know, enough to really catch my attention. Mm. Um and then I just had this immediate feeling, oh, wait a minute. First of all, I want to know more about that. But second of all, I want to know what is Jonathan's perspective on Mars, <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And for any of you who were part of the Rebecoming the One Symposium, Jonathan also was my co-facilitator for the week on the Divine Person. You can still, it's all still free. You all, all can still go back and watch the whole month-long symposium anytime you want. But when we were focused on the divine person, we were really focusing on more of the non-binary, the gender fluidity aspect of gender. We weren't really focused. The, there, were, there was a full week on the divine feminine, a full week on the divine masculine. And then our week, your week with me came after those two focuses more on the polarities. And we were really holding space for the the non-duality, the non-polarity, the whole, the all of it. Yes, the complexity of all of it. So then when we now are about to open up this conversation about Mars, it's just such a different, <laughs> it's a different, it's, you could say it's more focusing on one end of the polarity or not, or, you know, yeah. but that's where my mind immediately goes, right? So, um, yeah, so this is a really different kind of conversation for the two of us to be having. And, and there's so much here especially given what is currently happening in the world etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. um yeah and uh you know i just i feel so many directions we can go but <clears throat> would would it feel right to you to just take a moment <laughs> to sit here and and even um center together for for just a brief second because i can even feel in my own body my own my activation with when mm -hmm. i think of mars it's really easy to get activated in myself um yeah so yeah and i i could even just invite everybody listening to come into our bodies and just be in that still present place <clears throat> so yeah Jonathan welcome thank you Martha and I I really honor your knowing and your impulse in that moment to allow us to kind of make a little bit of extra space because I think that's precisely a lot of the work that I've been doing with Mars in the past few years, you know, that I'm now 
inviting people into with this eight week container, um, I feel like what I want to share with you about the container, but also about my working with Mars in general is that for some reason, when this idea of this offering came to me, my first response was no, like I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want anything to do with Mars, which I think is understandable probably for a lot of people who are listening to this, a lot of people who are in your um, community. I think a lot of us have experienced really um, unrefined, harmful, violent expressions of Mars, you know, somewhere along the lines. And also for me, I realize I'm coming to a moment where it wouldn't be right anymore for me to continue to perpetuate within myself this idea of Mars that is very one-sided, right? That is very much rooted in how the collective has presented it or has rather distorted it. And to continue to push away my own wisdom, my own martial wisdom. And I, I realize and I want to center the fact that for me, Mars is deeply related to my ancestry and to my own people. Can I pause you for one second? <laughs> just yeah. that, just that, what you just said, your own martial wisdom. Mm. I feel like I need to pause that moment. <laughs> yes, wow. let's pause. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, yes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. What if we each could find like that martial wisdom? I mean, I, I'm I'm like on the verge of crying because, you know, the bombings that just happened in Israel, right? If if we could yeah. if our whole world could just pause and be with the wisdom, like our martial literally our martial wisdom. Mm -hmm. That <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I want to validate that, Martha, <clears throat> because to me, a big teacher for me at this very moment as we're speaking is actually mars and cancer and mm -hmm. in traditional astrology mars has fallen in cancer right but i've been thinking about specifically you know with everything that's been going on in the world how you know i i see a lot of messages in social media about violence and justifying violence because there was no other option and I've been thinking for me personally about the times in my life where I have no choice and how the moments when I had no choice and the actions that had to come from that doesn't mean that the action that comes from that place of no choice was actually the right action, right? My no choiceness is actually separate from the action being justified or not justified. So I just, just want to presence that because that's something that I'm, I've been really sitting with and it feels really thorny. You know, Mars can bring up a lot of thorns, right? Mars brings up for me the violence that I've endured that has made me believe on a deep level that violence towards myself or violence towards the world is justified. This to me is the heart of the martial wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. How do you separate? How do you separate that this experience of violence happening to you or something unpleasant happening to you, something hurtful happening to you? And then you using that or we or one using that as justification for, um, for certain behaviors, you know? Yeah. Yes. And you were mm -hmm. about, before I interrupted you, you were about to speak about um, Mars and your ancestry. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, I also consider my inner child to be my ancestor because my inner child came before me mm -mm -mm. as well as my parents. Right. And um, for me, I was a very martial child. You know, I had a lot of energy everybody was trying to dominate me, right? Again, in traditional astrology, we see Mars labeled as the lesser 
malefic and Saturn as the greater benefic. And I think it's so funny that our response to Mars is always to try to shut it down. <laughs> like shut it down right now, shut it down right now, right? We try to Saturn our Mars. And this was my experience with a lot of people in my life. But the one person who didn't try to shut me down was actually my mom. <laughs> my mom, um, when I was in pre-K, uh, my, my mom used to get called into the school all the time because my teachers were always saying, Jonathan can't sit still. And my mom was like, what are you supposed to do? You know, <laughs> like, here's this little child with a lot of energy. We're just going to let them be them, you know? And so it's interesting for me to be thinking about my own lens and perspective and experience with Mars being so deeply tied actually to uh, teachers who are in female bodies. My first Mars teacher was my mom. And then I remember watching Sailor Moon, which I have been joking, jokingly saying that was my first astrology course. Wait, <laughs> watching again? watching Sailor Moon, the anime. I don't know if you know, it's like <laughs> this cartoon anime that was really popular in the 90s. Um, mm. And Sailor Moon uh, was about this, this girl who got picked to be someone who like saved the world essentially from evil. And her whole team was, um, you know, there was at first Sailor Moon and then there was Sailor Mars, there was Sailor Venus, there were all these different, um, essentially like female warriors, you know, you should check it out. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's such a great show. But I remember being so drawn when I was a child to Sailor Mars. So mm -hmm. I think I'm really bringing in all of this as well as the influences of the different teachers that I've had the privilege to study from who are very martial and who are mostly women. And so I really want to, I think, bring and center this way of looking at Mars that is also to kind of use your, your um, phrasing terminology that was really connected to the divine feminine too, you know? that isn't just this kind of um, destructive, very forward facing, um, yeah, very authoritarian Mars. I think there's many different expressions of Mars. And I think that oftentimes when we identify as artists or as mystics, right? We push away contemplating the martial and often I think that is part of why um, maybe the world is still at the level of consciousness that it's currently at, you know, because there's a part of us that I think we are being called at this time. A lot of people who are sensitives, intuitives, mystics, you know, artists, dreamers, right, to really step into what does what does Mars mean to me? You know, what what does Mars what is Mars inviting me into? And what are the martial embodiments that feel honest and that feel nourishing to me in my work? How can Mars support um, this already beautiful uh, relationship, right? Commitment we have towards creating a more um, just world, creating a world where... Um, our creativity can flourish, right? Where, where um, we are really centered and moving from a space of love. You know, how do we do that? How do we enlist Mars to support us in that journey, right? I want to be very clear that I don't feel that the point of having a devotional praxis or relationship with Mars is to become more martial, actually. Mm -hmm. I think the point of of training with Mars is to um, is to allow our Venusian desires or our Jupiterian dreams, right, or our uh, lunar impulses, you know, to actually um, move through us in a way that we can give birth to in in real time. Because I ultimately, for me personally, when I think about what Mars mean to me, the first phrase that comes is Mars is the river of life, you know? 
Mars is about the fact that we live in this moment, right? Like right now I'm talking to you, Martha. I, I could have prepared all night long for this conversation, but the moment decides, right? In this moment, I don't have a choice. I can only go with the flow of time and the flow of life as it's happening right now. I can only say what feels prescient and what feels uh, important and flowing through me right now. And, and so I kind of want to bring us back to the, the beginning of this conversation, you know, where we were talking about the activation that we can feel with Mars. You know, I think a lot of us have been taught in the West, you know, in the healing modalities that we have learned, you know, the, the idea is always to like downregulate, downregulate, right? But I'm I'm kind of challenging us here to also notice like what happens if I actually flow with it, right? Mm -hmm. What ha happens if I let that aliveness that feels so out of control, what happens when I ride with it mm -hmm. and trust that especially as someone who has been working for many, many years to cultivate compassion, right? To cultivate um, magnanimity, you know, to cultivate wisdom that I'm not going to lose control here, right? That actually, as I ride with life, um, beautiful things can come forward and things can happen relatively quickly too, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pause there and because <laughs> I want to hear what, what is coming up for you. I feel like I've just said a lot there. No, it was so beautiful. What's coming up for me is that um, I'm feeling in myself, my south node conjunct my Venus in Aries <laughs> and Chiron, my <laughs> Venus, south node, Chiron conjunction <laughs> in Aries. That's what I'm feeling. And I'm feeling, I'm, I'm hearing in my mind the, um, <laughs> I did a lot of, of work with one particular astrologer I mean, personal, like where I was the client, right? One-on-one -on -one work around my Libra Aries dynamics for, mm -hmm. to sum it up in a very teeny tiny summary, um, especially when Pluto was squaring my Venus and squaring my nodes. <clears throat> so a lot was coming up with that whole thing. And what this person said to me repeatedly in most of my sessions essentially was to Saturnize my Mars. He didn't use those exact words, but he would say, Okay, yet again, I'm going to say to you, <laughs> you need to, when you feel that Mars drive to go after the thing, you need to slow down, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. which I mean, I, and I totally, totally, completely see his wisdom in it. And I can also say that, yeah, I, I have, <laughs> I have um, a lot of, tendency in my life when I'm really clear I mean and then my Mars happens to be an Aquarius so mm. when I'm really clear on what I'm meant to do I do it boom done <laughs> right and, yes. and people, anybody who's watched my life over the last two years you can see that's what I do um I get a lot done really fast and it's just done po per period yeah. the end which which has amazing strengths and sometimes you know, especially more on a personal level, I can jump into a situation and go, wait a second, <laughs> Just, you know, hang on, I don't necessarily want to do this. Um, I mean, nothing like horrible, but, you know, I get his point, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet, <laughs> and yet there's something, there's a Martian wisdom also in that impulse to move. It's not just yeah. ignorant, like, unthinkingness it, there is something in my soul with that flow you're talking about that that I'm going down a particular flow and so anyway I'm just I don't have any conclusions or judgments about any of that I'm just that's that's what's alive in me so I'm naming mm. it <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah I love that I love that so much and I um have also been thinking about even just the words themselves, like martial arts, right? A lot of our ancestors have practices that connect to martial arts, you know? And and I've been really sitting with what what is what does this look like if we treat the cultivation of our Mars as an art, right? I also, one other way that I've been contextualizing Mars is as our unique life force, right? Our Mars is 
like I've been thinking about this force, you know, like what is that unique life force, right? And one way that I've been contextualizing it is that our unique life force, our chi, our prana, right, is like the way that our cells coalesce in order to knit us into this like unique being that we are. You know, it's like how do how do my cells know how to interact with one another such that I become Jonathan? And how do your cells know how to be with one another so that they create Martha? right? Mm -hmm. Two separate beings in two separate spaces, you know, there is something about uh, working with Mars that has to do with knowing precisely how our Mars needs to, needs to flow, right? How do we express our Mars in a way that feels right to us? And, you know, your Mars in Aquarius, my Mars in Capricorn, in traditional astrology, they're both ruled by Saturn, you know, and there is kind of the Saturnian quality to them. You know, yours is definitely maybe more outward, you know, more uh, diurnal, more young, right? Mine is more yin, you know, and, and has this flow to it. But but this, our Mars, both our Mars have this quality of like premeditation, of contemplation, of discipline too, right? And that's not the case for everyone. You know, some people have their Mars and Aries and, and they move when it's hot, right? And it's like, how do you work with that really swift movement and and to tend to, to yourself after, right? Because when you have Mars that's ruled by Saturn, you know, like the two of us, maybe it's more the case, not always, right? But maybe it's more the case that the premeditation takes up a lot of space and then the doing just happens really quickly, right? And maybe for, for Saturnian or Saturn ruled Mars, we don't do a lot of post aftercare. But for others, you know, who have maybe Mars and Aries, you may need to do a lot of post care. You know, you may need to deal with like the activation and maybe even the shame that comes up from, especially if you've been socialized to not be so spontaneous or not to be so rash, right? There can be, the, the mind can really jump in. And so I think again, like cultivating the body, the mind, and really getting to know like, what are these responses that come up when I'm Mars, right? And letting myself really sit with that. You know, I think that's really where a lot of, my own lens and my perspective of working with Mars comes from. Wonderful. Would yeah. you like to describe, I'm just curious to hear about the actual eight week container. Do you want to mm. say more about yeah. what, yeah, what tell, tell us. <laughs> yeah. So in this offering, I'm really, you know, th th there was an image that came to my mind about like my relationship with the participants mm -hmm. and the image that came was that, you know, the participants are really the ones running the marathon. I'm the marker, right? As well as the people standing by the sideline, you know, handing out like water and snacks, right? <laughs> like that's kind of how I approach this because it's not really, you know, one thing that I think one of my mentors, Britton LaRue, uh, talked about this in one of her lessons in a course that took a long time ago. She said, Mars is such an excellent teacher in real time. Like she was describing how in her own life, often Mars taught her more through transits rather than through um, like natal Mars, right? Mm -hmm. Like just thinking about sitting with natal Mars is like one approach, but transit and life as they are happening is kind of where the action is, you know? Yeah. And it's like, that's where the mar martial wisdom lies. And I think that's kind of the philosophy or the approach that I'm holding lightly where um, my, my goal, my intention is to hold the space, create the structure, right? Again, with my Mars and Capricorn, creating the structure for people to create their own martial practices. So mm -hmm. it will be very experiential, right? It will be actually not very astrological at all. Like I will be sharing a little bit, you know, some reflections on, so each week we're going to be, um, you know, we're, we're, we're inviting in, I'm inviting in a, a guide, you know, so we start with Mars and Gemini and then we, we go to Mars in domicile and uh, in exaltation in traditional astrology. So we, second week is we go to Mars in Scorpio and then 
Mars in Aries, and then Mars in Capricorn. And then the mm -hmm. second half of the course is the mirror image of that. So we will um, start the second half with Mars in Cancer, and then Mars in Libra, Mars in Taurus, and we're going to end with Mars in Sagittarius because that's where the container will end. We'll end the container with Mars in Sagittarius. And, and so um, each week we'll be feeling into what some of the virtues, what some of the lessons and wisdom of Mars being in each of these places are. And we're going to be approaching it actually not from you know, kind of a, an intellectual space so much, but we're going to be working with movements. We're going to be working with energy work. And we're also going to be working with self-inquiry. And something I should also mention is that, you know, I want to represent the um, teachings of my ancestors because I come from people who migrated from China you know, back many, many generations ago. I actually grew up in Indonesia, but my, my ancestors came from China and they, um, you know, one of the energy work um, tradition in China is Qigong. And if you look at Qigong, Qigong is very much about working with visions, right, of nature and kind of replicating it through movements in the body. And so this is how I'm actually approaching movement. I'm not approaching movement from the perspective of like, for example, somatic experiencing where, you know, you have certain very specific movements that you do in order to clear things out or things like that. The way that I approach it is actually through visions and then we translate it into movement. So in a way, what we're gonna be doing for those eight weeks is to build a set of unique practices that we can, use that are really rooted in and uh, blossoming forth from your own unique perspective mm -hmm. because what you know the movements that may work for me martha is not necessarily the, the movements that will work for you you know we all have different bodies you know um even like the group that has coalesced so far we have quite a range you know in terms of age right and and in terms of like ancestry and in terms of life experiences you know so i'm not going to assume that i know what the right movement medicine is for you mm. but we're going to be working with it together so that you can have the structures necessary to to start to see it beginning to like come up and surface for you because my own experience for example with qigong has been really surprising to me because I grew up in Indonesia, where a lot of my people experience erasure and the need to assimilate. And what I've experienced when, when I start to uh, come into relationship with some of these ancestral practices is that my body remembers them first wow. before my mind is able to be like, oh, these are the rules, right? Or like, these are the 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 um the philosophy but my body remembers it first mm. and and so i want to kind of create a space where we all can experiment with that trusting that our bodies have wisdom that our ancestors have been passing down to us you know through our dna and through our cells mm -hmm. beautiful yeah i'm i'm thinking about two things one one is the relationship between Mars and Venus, both with movement and body, right? I was realizing, mm -hmm. certainly I think of Venus with dance and motion and kind of fluidity and sensuality and all of sexuality, all of it, but, and mm -hmm. Mars <laughs> also, of course, is movement, sexuality, but it's, a. I was just feeling into the, what the two energies feel like in my own being, mm -hmm. um, and and then my other train of thought was was also uh, noticing and seeing in myself how you know of course the North Node currently is in Aries ruled by Mars and early next year is going to come into a conjunction with Chiron right so I'm thinking about ancestral healing ancestral wisdom um, body wisdom body heal all of it is just yeah it's just a there's so much, I think, uh, 
available to us and alive over the coming months, year, year and a half Mm -hmm. around, around this, like coming into our body wisdom, coming into the, what is alive? What's that stream of wisdom that wants to move through us? Right. And, and is there a way that, that with Chiron being so present, especially next year, um, is there another way of being with our bodies, being with that ancestral wisdom that is still here, right? Literally right here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you yeah. have any thoughts on that, but that's what's up for me. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that um, we're moving away uh, or a lot of us feel the the hunger, the impulse to kind of move away from uh, one way of approaching learning and one way of approaching our experiencing which is you know we sit down we receive a ton of information right we read books and then we uh, begin to unravel that and see how we can apply that in our lives right I think that a lot of us are craving another way which is maybe to give ourselves permission to really be with our human experience and then to start to allow that to be the first step. You know, I, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I think that for a long time, you know, for efficiency's sake, right? We used to live in a world where getting information was not easy. You know, if you <laughs> even think about like when I was growing up in the 90s, right? My mom used to sell these like encyclopedias, you know, these huge like sets mm-hmm. of encyclopedias, right? For like, um, like extra um, pocket money, I guess, <laughs> for our household. And that was really important, you know, at that time, because we didn't have access to information that's literally like right here in our fingertips, right, on on Google and chat GPT and and things like that. But I think we're now living in a world where where all that information is so easy to access, right, not saying all of that is correct, but that I think the invitation is more to slow down, you know, it's much harder to be with our experience. I was thinking about how you know, it's it's been a really long time for me since I was bored, you know, and there's wisdom in that boredom, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that um, to kind of maybe tie it back into Mars, I think it can be so easy to live in 2023 or whenever you're listening to this in the future to almost miss the wisdom of life as it's happening in front of you right now because you're so busy chasing information you know, through the million podcasts and YouTube channels and emails and piles and piles of books that are available out there. And again, I don't think that that way of learning, right, is not, is no longer valid because I think for certain kinds of knowledge, it absolutely is, you know, like, for example, thinking about like, how can I read charts, right? How can I start to learn astrology as a system? I think we do need to sit down and read the books, you know, but but I, I feel that where I'm currently being called in my life, and I, I feel that this has to do with the astrology, but I can't really make sense of it. I can't mm-hmm. contextualize it just yet, you know, but where I'm really being drawn to by my guides and by... um my inner mm, movement and inner impulse is to really work with it holistically, right? Um, And I think for me, again, like this is so ancestral because a lot of my ancestors, this is how they, this is what their spirituality looks like. You know, there was no division between the body and spirit, right? Like that concept was not really something that they, um, they adhered to. You know, there was definitely gradients, right? There were definitely different, you know, the the spirit world and the body world were different dimensions, but they were always thought to be interconnected with one another. They weren't two separate things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. actually, yeah. (laughs) not surprisingly, it's also what you're saying is tied, so tied into what I'm being told to do in my own work over Mm -hmm. the coming year or years, whenever, um, but again, two trains of thought. So one is as you're as you're describing what you're describing, I'm thinking of myself and how 
starting in my early 20s okay when I was 21 I first I took my first Reiki class right and then later in my 20s I became I studied massage and I took a break I was originally a social worker clinical psychotherapist and then took a little break went to massage school did massage for five years and then went back to being a psychotherapist social worker all that um but in that in my my late 20s when I was focused on doing body work something that I realized about myself pretty quickly is that um when I have my hands on people in particular I can see the meridians and I can see the body systems I can see the organs I can see anyway you know I have Hygieia conjunct my moon on my ascendant in Virgo <laughs> um and then Chiron on my south node I mean it's like anyway hands on healing is a thing definitely there in me and so I was really confused when I first realized in my early to mid 20s that I could see meridians of what in the world Mm. I didn't couldn't I still don't know any other people who do although I know they exist and if anybody out there knows someone who does I would love to know who they are (laughs) because for 20 years I've been trying to find other people who do but but what I then read about in you know the history of traditional Chinese medicine is that of course how did the meridian system get birthed in the or how did the knowledge of it get birthed well there were people who could see it and feel it and it right that's absolutely a thing um it didn't just get made out of nothing it's not the Mm -hmm. figment of anybody who's gotten acupuncture and been really um helped by it which I certainly have and lots of people have it's a real thing right so, so where, where's the disconnect? Like, why am I, why have I had such a hard time finding other people who can see meridians, for example? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like this disconnect of our consciousness and our body and, and, um, and related to that in terms of the work that I'm being called into this coming year is two main things. One is this infinite soul wisdom astrology 101 course, which I'm holding and the way the spirit world is actually having me do it is they're calling it a they're calling it a portal of remembering Mm -hmm. so it's meant to be um again it's you know certainly it will include the pisces equals this mars equals this you know all of that but it's really actually more about holding a sacred space for the, each person to do their own remembering through their being, through their body, yeah. through their soul. So that's number one. It totally fits with what you're saying. And then number two, which I find really interesting as you're talking, is um, on the other side of the work I'm going to be doing is I'm meant to, I'm supposed to be holding a container of, the wording isn't quite there yet, but it's it's essentially a remembering of our <clears throat> Our ultimate highest um, energetic blueprint, Mm -hmm. right? So originally I was thinking, oh, okay, they want me, they meaning the spirit world wants me to do a chakra healing class or something. And then I got told, nope, no, 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 that's actually too uh, formulaic, formulaic, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's too concrete. That's not the point here. The point is actually to hold a container similar to what you're discussing, um, of helping us each and all to remember on our own highest, most aligned level, what is actually the the energetic blueprint that's naturally our divine way, right? Yes. And that might change from moment to moment, but but there and there, but there might not be a formula out there that could tell you, okay, here's the chakra system, here's the color that goes with that chakra, here's the, right. It's like a coming into our own container, our own beautiful divine blueprint, which again might be evolving moment to moment to moment to moment. Again, kind of going with that flow of life, yeah. you know, um, and that there's nobody out there who could tell you precisely the truth for you about you. Exactly. Um, yeah. So anyway. I yeah. absolutely love those two ideas Martha I want to (laughs) like I want to continue talking to you about it in other conversations too because I feel like it's so 
potent. And that's, I, I really feel a lot of resonance with that. I'm not surprised, you know, both of us are Virgo risings with Pisces and the seventh house and our descendants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's like sun in Pisces. So there, there's definitely a lot of uh, resonance, but I, I love that that's what your guidance is um, pulling you towards because, um, because I think it's much, much needed. You know, this, this kind of work is I think much needed because um, I think systems are great, but I also think that especially a lot of us who grew up in the West, who are trained with the Western system of education ends up attaching to the systems more than understanding the essence. And I think then there's a bit of a breakdown here, right? So I think we're kind of in a moment where we are holding the, the complexity of the both end. You know, we, we need to understand the essence before we can fully appreciate the system. I think that's where I see a lot of um, mismatch, you know, and, and again, you, I, I, I was actually curious, because you mentioned Reiki, did you ever work as an energy healer or like an energy healing sessions? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the biggest part of what I, yeah. That's the biggest part of what you do, yeah. Um, because the reason why I ask, because, you know, I was also trained in various different energy healing modalities, but when the person comes to me in a session, all of my education goes out the window, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. You're just like really working with whatever you're seeing, you know, whatever's in front of you. And I think that's precisely how it's supposed to be because, um, because everyone's so different and everyone's always changing all the time too, right? And I think, again, to kind of tie it back to Mars, this to me is like, this to me is like the flow of life that Mars is, is teaching us to work with, right? Because, you know, nobody here listening will ever wake up on two separate days and feel exactly the same. Like you're kind of never the same being twice. Yeah. And I think this is to me, why working with Mars, there's kind of this call to work with that aspect of um, of our spirituality, of our lived experience, because I think so many of us have been taught to separate our spirituality from the rest of our lives, right? It's like, when you are getting triggered, you know, go back into your room and like, you know, do your somatic exercise or do your meditation. Like, this was how I approached it for many, many years, you know, but honestly, Martha, the reality is when my partner said something very triggering, I have two seconds to decide <laughs> what to do about it, right? <laughs> like, or less. I can either, you yeah. know, or less, <laughs> or like, you know, I, I can either respond with my middle fingers or I can respond by repressing myself or I can respond by by something else, right? Like what happens when I have um, cultivated enough practices so that I can be nimble in the moment mm -hmm. and I can dance with the moment so I can come into like a third, a secret third thing, right? That mm -hmm. none of us can really using our minds premeditate. So I think really like the, the heart of this class is to work with spirituality and it's funny because it's like, I, I have a hard time languaging this in the course page because I did say, you know, oh, we're going to be engaging with contemplative practices. But I think when I talk about contemplation, I'm not just talking about secluding ourselves from the rest of reality. I think contemplation is always happening, right? We're always kind of in contemplation with life all the time. Like it can be a way of moving through life. So, yeah. Beautiful. So, okay, so maybe in and helping us to come into some kind of closure with this, the thing the the big thing on my mind as we're talking right this minute is, um, okay, we're recording this on October tenth, twenty twenty three. And so this weekend, two days ago, <clears throat> Mars was in an exact square to Pluto. and yeah. Mars is about to enter Scorpio. And in the shamanic astrology version of the Mars cycle, which I am not an expert in, not an expert in, <laughs> but I, I know enough to know that Mars is about to go into the underworld in their way of seeing cycles. Mm -hmm. um, because it's it's about to go into its exterior conjunction with the sun. Okay. So 
all of that, saying all of that, um, we can see very clearly also what, you know, given what happened this weekend in Israel, that those those dynamics, Mars squaring Pluto in particular, certainly, certainly can play out in the way that a traditional approach to astrology would predict lots of volatility, lots of combustible power dynamics, you know, um, mm-hmm. its use of power, et cetera, et cetera, all of that, right? Okay, that's true. <laughs> and um, what's alive in me, and I think what you're saying is alive in you is yes and right like like i'm not going to deny that reality and let's move into another way because there is absolutely there are so many other ways to be with these energies um so first of all is that in alignment with what you are trying to express okay (laughs) just yeah absolutely so then so then following with that um in your work with Mars in this container and also just in your life in general, what is your ultimate vision or your ultimate goal um, in general and also specifically in how we meet Mars in ourselves, in the world, Mm -hmm. in life, um, in these moments, in this time? Yeah. First of all, that is a great question. And that's such a beautiful question, Martha. I'm really grateful that you asked that question. Um, What's alive for me, as you were asking that, is that to me, working with Mars is to work with the discomfort and the pain of being alive, Mm -hmm. right? In the past few days, what I continue to hear from my friends, um, some of whom are, you know, have personal ties to these lands, right, where um, strife and wars are happening right now, and some of whom are just deeply feeling people, is how hard it feels to be alive, mm-hmm. right? The discomfort of being alive. I think that historically, And this may be very much like my own super specific lens being like a Mars and Capricorn person. Very often in life, I think we we resort to really violent, really harmful, really destructive expressions of Mars because we don't know how to sit with that pain. We don't know how to metabolize that pain. We don't know how to how to flow with that pain and I think what I'm what I'm hoping (laughs) I'm not a masochist I promise but what I'm hoping is for us to to actually learn to allow the innate compassion softness and deep deep reassurance and loving towards that part of us that's hurting Mm -hmm. so that so that in that alchemy, right, in the alchemy of the part that's wise and and uh, can hold space and the part that's really hurting, something else can emerge, you know, mm-hmm. that I don't think that when we allow these two parts to really come together, I don't think that what will blossom forth is actually violence. I don't think what will blossom forth is actually this desperate move to to try to uh, wiggle out of a situation and hurt a lot of people in in the in the act of doing that. So, I want to uh, bring us for some reason. What's really coming up for me right now, Martha, is uh, the the Orphic Hymn to Mars. So I'm not going to recite the whole thing, but if you look up the Orphic Hymn to Mars, it's really divided into two sections. The first section, and this is one of my teachers who has really taught me about this and help me in my contemplation i want to honor her her name is kristen mathis who she's a very venusian person (laughs) and i just really love her her uh take on this because she was really pointing out how the orphic hymn to mars is divided into two sections the first section was uh the 
the poet, right? Really acknowledging the forcefulness, the the war loving, uh, blood blood hungry, bloodthirsty uh, guys of Mars. And then in the second half, it was basically saying stop, and instead play with Venus. Essentially, have sex with Venus, right? Or uh, go with Dionysus, you know, like have have a party with Dionysus, right? Like support that uh, jovial life giving, and also, by the way, uh, death um, death friendly or or death uh, welcoming right of Dionysus, right? Because Dionysus is both aliveness and death too. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a way in which, you know, with Dionysus, I think it's about Mars can really work with Dionysus to honor the, the cycle of life, right? That life needs to end in order for more life to come to come up, you know, not in like a war sense, but in a natural death, natural decomposition way. Or the other option that was given was to collaborate with Ceres and protect the children and protect the people who, who grow the food, right? And so I think that's really my intention and my heart and my dream with this offering. And with kind of, you know, even if this offering is not right for people at this time, like to invite people into deeper contemplation with Mars, because I think Mars is the one force that really needs wielding. You know, but we can't wield Mars. We can't train with Mars if we are so afraid of Mars. If we're continuing to push our Mars away, if we're continuing to uh, not want to look at our pain, our anger, our frustration, our impulses, right? Uh, where is all of that energy going to go? It's not going to just vanish and disappear, right? We can't pretend that Mars is not part of our aliveness. And so... Yeah, I think that also, you know, something I want to say that's really specific to this very moment of, you know, this this war that's breaking out is that the truth is a lot of us are really bystanders. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about like how part of being in right relationship with the world is to sometimes accept that you are a bystander. And so as a bystander, I think a lot of us have deep responsibilities. You know, how do we not approach right looking at this event that's happening right now from the perspective solely of our trauma mm. how can we work maybe or if we want to use that lens how can we work with it consciously you know many of us are here as products of war right yeah a lot of us have been displaced you know our ancestors were displaced from their from their homeland you know and a lot of us uh you know, came here because of violence that happened to people who look like us or people who hold our identities, you know, including sexual identities. And so I want to invite us into working with Mars because I believe that working with Mars is one of the ways that we can um, we can come into right relationship with the more gnarly parts of our experiences right? Mm -hmm. That we don't let that run the show unconsciously, but rather we we work with it, we work alongside it so that we can see what else can come up. You know, I don't know what that is, right? I mean, here's the, the pedagogical secret, right? I, I wanted to start this particular container with Mars and Gemini and Mars and Sagittarius because I truly believe that how we name our experiences and our beliefs around our experiences really influence how we end up channeling our Mars, how we end up embodying our Mars. Mm -hmm. I think working with Mercury and Jupiter is such an important part of working with Mars. In mm -hmm. fact, I think working with all the other planets is like what we are really invited into when we work with Mars, right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's not the point of working with Mars isn't to become more martial, isn't to become more ruthless, isn't to become more decisive, you know, or like be this like boss babe, you know. <laughs> I think that the, the point of working with Mars is to um to be who we already are. You know, a lot of the people listening to your channel, Martha, I imagine are healers, are people who really want to are creatives, you know, people who really want to see beautiful things blossom in the world. The point is to have more of that actually right 
and to not let a lot of this hanging, you know, repressed aggression and um, impulses kind of stop us from really birthing um, what's beautiful into the world. And to also, to you know, one final thing to say, too, is that in order for beautiful things to happen in the world, we need that martial energy, right? We need that push. You know, I see you, for example, in um, organizing Rebecoming the One. I mean, that was a lot of martial invitations, you know, putting sure. out <laughs> different emails and being like, hey, you know, like, please... Uh, respond to the form that I sent you like there's something <laughs> very martial about that too and I think really like coming into contact and and seeing these parts of us the ways we're already martial right and then uh, gently working with them I'm all about working gently I'm not here to kind of push people past their you you can already tell probably from my personality you know I'm not really someone who's like ah you know <laughs> yeah so hmm I think yeah. that's that's all I want to share. But yeah, thank you for your invitation. And I'm really curious. I'm really curious, actually, to hear your relationship with Mars, too, Martha, if you want to share. <laughs> that's so interesting, because what I, I was about, I was feeling really called to talk about my own. <laughs> Here's what I was about to say. I'm really feeling like I, for some reason, need to say before we end. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there you go. You'll get your you know, get your wish. <laughs> um, yeah, no, right. As you're talking, the, the other thing that's coming up for me is um, when you and I last really, really, really spoke, I mean, we, we just had this panel together two weeks ago, but, but the time before that was when we were part of the Rebecoming the One Symposium. And what we were, what we talked a lot about in that moment was the fact that I had just ended the week on the divine masculine in rebecoming the one and that week was very challenging for me and pretty traumatizing um and largely because i would say that a lot of what came up in that week was what i could call the wounded masculine i don't i don't know what words to put to this but anyway something mm -hmm. along those lines and so what has transpired for me since then is that i feel like in myself I've I've come to a closure place with a lot of my own karma, my own relationship to, again, what you could call the wounded masculine. I don't really, these words are weird, right? But mm -hmm. <laughs> for lack of better words. Um, and that certainly had a lot to do with my relationship with my dad who died last December, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what has been so interesting, I was talking to Chris Skidmore about this the other day, um, what's been so fascinating to me is that since I kind of had that sense of closure last June, I, I had been really focused on, um, healing or, you know, holding space for all aspects of, of the feminine, the masculine, the non-binary, the all of us, everybody to come together, to be heard, to to heal, to transform all of it. That was the whole point of that symposium. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I just I'm dedicated to doing that in general. And and specifically what was really calling my attention was the holding space for the wounded masculine or the aspects of maybe people who identify as masculine or whatever it is to voice their own needs and their hurt, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I did that. And, and I was, I was pretty, a lot of my attention was on that wounded masculine in various ways. But since I felt like I came to closure with that, what suddenly ended up happening actually in my own world is that it, it's like the, I would, what I would call more of the, the positive masculine, just in my own world, in my own life, in my own self, in my family, in my friendships and everything, it just rushed in. It was like, and then I suddenly realized, wait a minute, this has been here this whole friggin' time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, very long story, very short. It's like, I realized, okay, my dad had, was a complex person. There were lots, there were lots of aspects of him that were definitely representations of that wounded masculine. So that's what I was pretty focused on. 
but there were parts of him that were also really beautiful and really mm-hmm. unconditionally loving and all of that. But both of my grandfathers, beautiful, beautiful relationships to the masculine between me and them, my uncles, um, my cousins, <laughs> every other man, male identified person in my family, so beautifully positive masculine presence for me. Um, and when I would go into my own inner masculine over the last two, three years, what I actually discovered with well, the first time I, I went and found him was he is in very, very positive masculine presence, right? So it was like my own, again, Mars isn't only masculine. I get that. And also in my own relationship to my Mars, what I realized is that is that I have this presence in myself of a actually really grounded, patient, um, magical, wise, unconditionally loving, masculine being in me, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, because I was so focused on, I needed to heal my relationship with the wounded masculine. I really did. That was a huge part of my karmic thing in this lifetime. But I feel like I've done a lot of it. I'm sure not all of whatever. <laughs> I did a lot. I've done a lot of it. And now it's suddenly like this, the positive aspects of the masculine are boom, right here and right in front of me, you know? Yes. And not that they weren't there before. They were already always there. But yes. it's, it's like, it's right here now. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, yeah, it's an ongoing process. But um, so so that's part of what I'm feeling as you're talking about the need to be with maybe if you want to call it the shadow aspects of our Mars relation, whatever it is, it's, it's not only about, to me, it feels like it's not only about um, suffering and like feeling the pain of it. I mean, that's could be part of it. Certainly not to, not to run away from the pain, pain, you know, really meet the pain and in my own experience. And I think watching other people as well through my life as a therapist and all of it. um, Sometimes also what can happen is that once we, once we do give attention to those parts that are hurting and they are able to heal and come, come to some kind of closure, suddenly we can have this rushing in of fresh blood, right? That maybe the blood was always there. It's just now we can let it come in and we can be nourished in this way. That's, you know, I, I just never expected. <laughs> and yeah. yet there's nothing new that came, nothing that wasn't there before is that's here, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I can I share a yeah. reflection yeah, Martha, yeah, yeah. as a friend? Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've been kind of watching your your work, like mm-hmm. how you hold your your business from afar. And I've just always marveled at the level of structure that was there, the skillfulness of how you kind of steward your work and also your level of like an energetic capacity. I think that, you know, this is something that one of uh, my my uh, mentors, Ari Felix and I have been talking about, which is that um, holding space is actually very masculine. It's not like a, it's not like this feminine thing, right? Like when you hold space, which you do Martha for a lot of the people in your community, it's extremely masculine because basically you have to be holding the structure for people to be, you know, some people are going to be flowering and some people are barely, you know, pushing up the ground. But to recognize and to honor that everybody's on their own journey and that journey looks very different from one plant in the garden to another plant in the garden is like that is actually a masculine function. Mm. You know, if we have to kind of separate it into masculine and feminine. So, yeah, I really honor your experience of working with the wounded masculine and then really seeing this like divine sacred masculine expressions coming in because I think that the wounded masculine is simply the ignored part right or the the repressed part of that sacred masculine so it makes a lot of sense to me and something I want to say too is that you know if you are listening to this and you are like you know, I am in a male body, I don't really see myself as like the soft person, you know, Um, but you feel the call to also work with this energy, you know, to work with Mars. I'm really calling you in too, 
you know, into this container as well as into the larger work, right, that we are talking about here because um, your presence is so needed. And it's like, I want to really challenge, especially any male body person listening to this, if there are any. And the only reason why I'm doing this is because I'm also in this process myself. You know, was there a part of you, was there a little boy that you really need to see eye to eye, you know, at this moment that was feeling rejected in your childhood? Because I think that's a huge part of experience that my experience that I never really talk about, that I never really look at, you know, that is not really talked about in the collective. Like a lot of little boys out there, uh, you know, little humans in male bodies are really born with such incredible reservoir of energy as well as intelligence that comes with that, you know, uh, overflow of energy right and we were a lot of us were not allowed a lot of us expressed that and we were seen as a threat you know so i kind of want to uh give you space you know to really contemplate like was that part of your experience you know what happens if you compassionately as your adult self now try to talk to that part of you you know and validate that part of you that you can be here now you know I didn't realize this, Martha, but this wounded part was really running the show for me for such a long time. And it didn't show because it wasn't acting out. It was repressing itself, mm-hmm. you know? And it was like from the outside, you know, for people who like look at me and they see that I'm like in a male body, even though I also acknowledge the complexity of my sexuality and my gender identity, they may see me and they're like, oh, you know, what a what a well-developed male person. You know, but actually, in reality, there was a lot of repression that I was holding. And I'm still working through that. And I think that so many of people who are in male bodies just don't know how to deal with it. (laughs) And I feel very passionate about, like, um, holding space for whoever needs space help for this kind of work to happen. You know, and I also really trust that the group that is coalescing will also hold you in this process you know so yeah 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 and and also I last thing I feel to say is as I've been in my own process with you know closing my cycle of karma with the wounded masculine that whole thing so a really close friend of mine one of the only people I've really you know really gone into depth with about my process with the whole thing I I was saying to her a month or two ago Yeah, I think I'm I'm done. I'm done with my relationship. This is the way I put it. I'm done with my relationship to the wounded masculine. She said, Can I offer you a reflection on this? I said, Of course. And she said, I wonder if it's not so much that you're done with your relationship to the wounded masculine. It's more actually maybe you're you're ready to move on to um you're ready to move on from giving any of your power or your sense of self value to the wounded masculine. Mm -hmm. And I went, boom, (laughs) there we go. That's it. Yes. Because I am, I am not, and none of us can really be ever like, that's not the point here. We're not done with our relationship to the wounded masculine. I realized immediately when she said that, no, wait a second. You're right. That's such a big, no, I'm not, we can't be, how can we be right? Um, so speaking for myself, but I think it's so parallel to our whole world and even what's happening in the world right this minute. It's not that we need to reject a big segment of our own masculine and masculine in the world. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is to come into a different relationship within ourselves to that energy in ourselves, in the world, et cetera. So it doesn't need to dominate us it doesn't need to define who we are it doesn't need to you know again speaking in my relationship to it how I used to feel was more like looking to that wounded masculine for approval or blah 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 right and so that's what I'm coming to closure with is my own my own relationship to it not the quality of the relationship not the fact that it exists right I don't I don't need Mm -hmm. to just reject the whole thing it's a really actually reorienting in me 
what is I my way to it. responding yeah yes. yeah and i Absolutely. feel like that's yeah if we start rejecting it you know what happens <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that doesn't go very well <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly and at the same time you know putting up boundaries around it is yes. not rejecting it you know even yeah. though feelings of rejection will come up <laughs> yes. you put up the boundaries you know mm-hmm. yes. absolutely yeah exactly beautiful <laughs> mm. okay um so unless there's some other thing you feel called to say uh i would love for you to share the the logistics the virgo part mm-hmm. yeah the virgo part <laughs> yeah awesome. the dates the when and the where and the how and the yeah <laughs> Go for yes. It. So it's for eight weeks. We start on October 24th. We meet every Tuesday, Tuesday night, uh, Eastern time, 730 to 930 Eastern um, for two hours. I am calling them practice sessions because that's what they really are. They're not really lectures. They're not really classes. We're going to be practicing together for eight weeks. And um, technically, registration is going to be open until whenever I feel this is the first time I'm running this particular container like this particular iteration of the container so I'm really feeling into does this feel uh like the right size you know when it gets too big I'm going to close it up so technically it's going to be open until like the night before but if you know that you're really called to it and you really are in like wanting to engage with this work specifically like I really call you in I want to you know, I welcome you to check out my podcast, like just feel into my vibe, but know that this is the work. This is work that you're going to be doing for yourself. This is not really about me. I'm just really holding the space. Um, two things maybe to keep in mind until October 12th, which is when Mars enters into Scorpio, like before Mars enters into Scorpio, anybody who gets in while Mars is still in Libra, I'm giving a little Venusian gift, which is a five to 10 minute audio I'm calling them love letter to your natal Mars, which I'm going to give at the end of the container. Um, I feel like, you know, when we're working with Mars, we just need all of the other allies to be in the space with us too. So that is going to be present. So if you know you want to do it and you're the kind of person who is motivated and incentivized by gifts, do it before October 12th. Um, But I also am very anti-urgency. So there's no like early bird, there's no discounts. I just create three tiers and you can choose in those three tiers what feels right to you at this moment. Um, Because yeah, that's how my nervous system likes to roll. And so I'm kind of providing that to people too. Um, Yeah, that's about it. And if you ever have any questions, you know, Martha will share all of my links. Just find me in one of the one of the things mm-hmm. beautiful and do people need to be there live will it be recorded that... great question this is this is how i've been answering this actually that's such a fabulous question martha i would say this is a self-leadership container you know feel into how you work best you know i personally am like a live person if i don't do the class life i probably won't do it but i'm not imposing that on you right? Like you might be the kind of person who's like the energy, the group energy is too intense. I want to do it by myself. Do that, you know, but commit to it. You know, I think that what I want to invite people into is to really feel into like what level of participation feels right to me, but also can I expand my comfort zone, right? Can I really step into maybe what doesn't feel super you know, comfy for me, right? What happens when I let myself ride that wave a little bit, you know? So the answer is no, it it will all be recorded. And again, uh, like Martha, I'm a Virgo rising. So I will create very specific and very like clear packets about like, this is what you need to do if you you miss class. You know, I, I also am designing the experience such that each week, is definitely there is continuity, but they don't really build on top of one another. So if you miss class or whatever, and you don't have time to catch up, you just jump right back in. Because I really want people to just participate and focus on the work rather than do the whole like, oh, I miss class. I can't come because blah, blah, blah. Like, we're not doing that in this class. We're all adults, you know, and and we're going to, 
yeah, learn as adults. <laughs> and this is really a space where I'm inviting you to like feel into like, how do you want to engage with this work, you know? And yeah, it's a lot of prompts. It's a lot of you doing, engaging with the work. I think the benefit of coming live is that there's just that group energy that sometimes for some of us are really, really helpful. I'm one of those people. I love being in groups because um, otherwise I just don't do the work sometimes. So, Well, and I would say one benefit of coming live with you is that you get you. <laughs> So, yes <laughs> um, I can just say you know I, I anybody who has seen the past interviews that Jonathan and I have done together especially the one where you interviewed me well, actually you've interviewed me twice both times you have interviewed me oh wow I mean it's an exquisite experience to be held in a container with you, Jonathan, really, truly. And, you know, again, I've said this so many times, how many people have said to me, I love Jonathan so much. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and I can't, there was one person, I can't remember their exact words, but it was hilarious. It was in a it was in a in a circle with multiple people and one person we were talking about the rebecoming the one talks and one person said oh and then there was this one person can't remember their name um but it's like like they they start talking and it's like you're suddenly enveloped in the arms of the divine or something it was something it wasn't those exact words but it was something along those lines and then another but th and then another person jumped in and said oh you mean jonathan and and then the first person was, yes 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 Jonathan like, what <laughs> you know like wow <laughs> okay then like they're mm. feeling the same thing with you right like they're having mm. that same something whatever that quality is is just yeah <laughs> mm. <laughs> quite mm. remarkable and I I I partially wanted to do this interview with you because I feel so one hundred thousand percent like I can trust my beloved, <laughs> my beloved people in my community to the arms of you. Right. And mm. so I know they're in amazing hands and I don't do that lightly. Like I'm not going to do this for anything and everything I hear out, out there. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So I highly, you, highly, highly endorse you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just so grateful to hear that. I feel very honored. And there's also a part of me that's like, what? They're yeah, talking about me. <laughs> I'm like, that must be they yeah. got the wrong person. So no, 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 no. um yes. They got the right, they got the right person. And I can hear, you know, like my kids in the background in my own head, like, how many people think of you like XYZ? You know, they don't know the real you. Like, well, <laughs> multiple sides to all of us. <laughs> yes, we're complex beings. For yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. But I can <laughs> affirm that I I totally see in you what they see in you, and mm. you are a gift. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you i appreciate that yeah mm -hmm. wonderful any closing words does that feel no just so much gratitude for you martha thank you for making space for this conversation i feel um this kind of huge relief actually talking to you because i felt you know over the weekend with everything that's going on in the world there's definitely like an inner critic part of me that's like, you know, who wants to do a Mars class, you know, looking at this, right, that's happening in the world. And I think I just feel so encouraged by your presence and by your trust and by your friendship. And I just really appreciate you and honor your work and your presence so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it's a, a uncanny, not a coincidence timing. That's what mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is what happens when you are trying to talk about an offering during an eclipse. <laughs> I'm vaguely remembering this is like not my first time doing something like this, you know, so I'm always like, I don't know. like, what are you doing, kid? Like, you're always doing this to yourself. But I don't know. I felt very... um pulled towards doing this offering this is my 
this is the first offering I'm I'm offering I'm sharing publicly that is like really just helped by me, you know. And I think there's also <laughs> intelligence in there. Yes, other than readings, this is the first like group offering that I'm doing that's just helped by me because I usually love collaborating so much, but this one was just coming in really hot and wanted to, like Mars was like, Mars. this is you, boo. Mars. This is you. <laughs> yeah, that's Mars. <laughs> your Martian intel, yeah. your Martian wisdom, literally, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. So it feels so meaningful that you um, offered to hold space for this conversation. And yeah, I'm just so, I feel really, really grateful. Thank mm. you. Well, I'm grateful too. And it just, yeah. Anyway, it feels like a gift to me, a gift to the community again anybody who feels called to be with you in this container and just everybody listening i feel like this this is exactly what the world is precisely needing right now <laughs> so thank you. thank you yeah blessings to you martha blessings yeah. to you everyone who's listening mm -hmm.